All right. Good afternoon. Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event hosted by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of tuition cost. One can also audit such a course at a much less cost. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This evening, we'll be hearing from Dr. Seth Jones. Dr. Seth Jones holds the Harold Brown Chair, is the Director of the Transnational Threats Project, and is a Senior Advisor to the International Security Program at their Center for Strategic and International Studies. He teaches at John Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies and the Center for Homeland Defense and Security at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. He's the author of A Covert Action, Reagan, the CIA, and the Cold War Struggle in Poland, Waging Insurgent Warfare, Hunting in the Shadows, The Pursuit of Al-Qaeda After 9-11, and In the Graveyard of Empires, America's War in Afghanistan. Dr. Jones is a graduate of Bowdoin College and received his MA and PhD from the University of Chicago. Dr. Jones, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Hannah, for that wonderful introduction. It's really an honor for me to um, be here uh, addressing folks at the Institute of World Politics. Um, what I'm going to do is, uh, I've got slides to show, but, but what I'd like to do is to highlight right from the beginning that while I'm going to be talking about a historical subject, and that is a covert action program that the Reagan administration authorized and then implemented in a Soviet-backed Poland during the 1980s, it has direct relevance to competition with the Russians and other countries today. So this is a historical case, but it has significant lessons today for how the US can and probably should act in competition. The way I'm gonna organize this talk is to begin with an understanding, particularly as the Reagan administration um, came into uh, in power in, the in 1980, um, what the environment was like with a special focus on service A of the KGB and its implementation of active measures. Then we'll look at what was going on in Poland in 1980 and 81, right around the uh, early part of the Reagan administration. Its decision then to authorize a covert action program. And then finally, if we get to it, we have time, some brief uh, implications for today. So let's start with a little bit of background to understand where the situation stood between the US and the Soviet Union um, in the final decade of the Cold War. And I think for, for, um, for those of us that remember quite uh, astutely, there was a division within Europe. Uh, the Soviets had support within the Warsaw Pact, countries like East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, the U.S. was a member of NATO. There's an iron curtain then that lay across uh, Europe, dividing between the Soviet and the U.S. and large European sphere influence. An important part of competition was certainly conventional and nuclear um, uh, operations or deterrence activities. Both the Soviet Union and the United States built conventional capabilities. They prepared for the U.S. prepared, for example, for uh, Soviet Red Army forces moving across the Fulda Gap in a conventional invasion of Europe uh, along the inter-German border. They also prepared for the use of nuclear weapons. This is mutually assured destruction, um, the realities of a mad world. But when it came to um, a lot of the day-to-day -day Soviet activities, it was to a great degree irregular. And one of the major uh, modes of, of Soviet activity was what they called active measures. And they were measures intended to influence populations across the world in ways that benefited Moscow on the one hand, and also undermined the United States, Moscow's main enemy, as well as the U.S.'s allies, including attempting to sow discord between the U.S. and its mainly European allies. The primary actor here on the Soviet side was service A of the KGB. And um, what, what it included in active measures were activities such as 
establishing front groups um, to funnel money to political parties, including uh, to the nuclear freeze movement in the United States, um, to uh, provide assistance to radio and other programs covertly so that they would beam information either into the United States or into other countries overseas in ways that would undermine the US, uh, to orchestrate information as well as disinformation campaigns. I know it sounds uh, familiar to probably all of us on, the, on this uh, session. And then a range of other activities, uh, including conducting assassinations. So much of this activity has been going on um, for years, if not decades. But what the uh, newly um, appointed CIA director, Bill Casey, says, beginning of the Reagan administration, you can see it at the bottom of the screen, is most of these active measures aren't new. Many of them were employed by Lenin and Stalin and by other Soviet leaders throughout history. At no time in this century, Casey argues, have these techniques been used with more effect or sophistication than by the current Soviet state. But at least as Casey argues from his perch, the CIA, that the, the Soviets, particularly the KGB, were more active than they had ever been in using these covert measures to undermine the United States. Um, here's a declassified assessment uh, from uh, CIA on uh, an example of how Soviet influence um, was divided up. You see on the left side, uh, these are the covert activities that I talked about or active measures. Uh, they were done by intelligence uh, service. They included all the items that I listed earlier from forgeries to agents of influence. On the right side are, are the overt activities. These are, and this is information that, that have come, that's come from um, Soviet state-owned and state-run uh, propaganda sources, including TASS, uh, party-to-party ties, so uh, ties between the uh, Communist Party of the Soviet Union and then Communist parties in other parts of the world, just general diplomatic efforts, um, economic aid, and then other military assistance programs. So combination of overt and covert uh, activity designed to influence um, countries and populations in ways that benefited the Soviet Union and undermined the um, I want to show you a couple of examples. Uh, on the left, we have uh, a debate about uh, the uh, nuclear, nuclear forces in Europe. Uh, the Soviets were incensed in the 1980s that the United States was going to um, add additional nuclear, uh, nuclear missiles into Europe as part of the TNF or theater nuclear forces. So one of the things that KGB did was um, to put it ads, obviously they didn't say this is the KGB doing it, but put ads saying things like no to U.S. missiles in Europe. They made it look like they were coming from uh, organizations like the World Peace Council, which looked like it was a non-governmental non organization dedicated to peace. In fact, it was, a, it was a KGB front organization. So these were ads placed in, in newspapers or magazines or journals uh, meant to influence population. Um, Operation Denver, which is on the right side, sometimes called Operation Infection, um, probably was the KGB's most successful or certainly one of the most successful disinformation campaigns of the Cold War and one that I'll talk about at the end uh, because the uh, Russian and Chinese and even Iranian responses to COVID-19 certainly echoed elements of Operation Denver. And this is where um, the KGB initially planted a an anonymous letter to the editor made it look like it was a, a U.S. A scientist that was uh, writing an anonymous letter to the editor of an Indian newspaper, The Express. And it was noting that AIDS was produced at a, a U.S. Uh, military laboratory, Fort Detrick, Maryland, and that uh, either purposefully or accidentally that AIDS virus produced, allegedly, by the United States uh, then leaked out, and that was the source of the infection that was rampaging through uh, much of the world, including Africa. Um, and over time, various uh, KGB offices throughout the world, including in Europe, as well as KGB uh, uh, allied services, especially Eastern European ones, 
started to uh, reproduce this argument that the United States had been the source of AIDS, either by the CIA or by the U.S. Department of Defense. Well, that caught on, and that that what was what was a complete disinformation campaign, entirely fake, caught on, and you know you can see in real public opinion polls by the mid 1980s and the end of the 1980s, including by U.S. organizations like RAND, uh, which is a federally funded research and development corporation, the U.S. Department of Defense, public opinion polls showed that decent numbers of uh, individuals in Africa, as well as, as African Americans in the United States, believed that um, AIDS had been produced by the U.S. So uh, in many ways, it was, a, it was quite a successful campaign this information campaign and impacting the views of individuals. Um, there were other disinformation efforts, probably less effective. These are declassified documents showing um, Soviet, uh, particularly KGB attempts to influence US elections, including the 1984 re-election of Ronald Reagan. They did not want Reagan to win, as well as the 1988 election uh, of George H.W. Bush. They didn't want him to win either. Both of them were pretty tried and true, uh, anti-communist, anti-Soviet. So uh, there were a number of efforts to um, uh, undermine uh, both of those campaigns. They failed, but it's still interesting to note that, they, that the KGB at least tried. I want to move then to what's going on in Poland. But let me just summarize for a moment. Uh, just put yourself in the position then of a, of a uh, newly elected U.S. president and his cabinet, including CIA director, that are seeing a major increase in KGB uh, influence operations going on inside of the United States, as well as uh, around the globe. Now, around the same time, remember Reagan gets elected in uh, the fall of 1980, and around the same time, we see uh, what looks like a crack forming in, in August of 1980, uh, the Gdansk Agreement is signed between the Polish government and Lech Wałęsa uh, as the leader of what is a budding movement um, called uh, Solidarity or, or Solidarność in Poland. Um, uh, Lech Wałęsa comes at that point. Um, he's uh, he's an electrician at the uh, shipyard in Gdansk. Um, and uh, leads a growing effort to establish independent self-governing trade unions in Poland. So by the fall of 1980, Poland has a growing number of individuals in solidarity. They've got authority now within Poland to be self-governing and independent, and particularly independent of the Polish Communist Party, which is a really important um, aspect of the trade union. So large, organized, and they were generally very opposed to what would become the uh, the, uh, the the government of uh, Yaroslavsky, Soviet-backed Yaroslavsky. November 1980, Reagan wins. So we have both uh, the cracks forming in Poland and Reagan winning in in 1980, and among other things, uh, choosing as his CIA director someone who wants to take a more aggressive approach to dealing with the Soviets. Uh, for those who know Casey well, he had cut his teeth in intelligence in World War II um, as a member of the OSS, uh, involved in uh, covert attempts to get individuals uh, inside of the Nazi territory in Germany and France and other locations. And when he is chosen to be CIA director, wants to go back to bold uh, covert action programs to weaken the Soviets. Tensions continue to exist and actually grow in Poland. So in 1981, Solidarity grows in size, uh, becomes bolder in um, encouraging other trade unions across Eastern Europe to also develop similar uh, arrangements with their governments, independent, self-governing trade unions. And back in Moscow, this smells like democracy. It smells like what these trade unions are calling for is political freedom and autonomy 
And in that sense, it, it's viewed as very dangerous. So I've got a, a declassified CIA assessment on the left side of the screen, uh, which um, is a good example among many uh, CIA assessments of the time where they were concerned about the possibility of a Soviet invasion. Soviets had obviously done this in Hungary, for example, um, and there was growing worry that the Red Army and potentially other members of the Warsaw Pact would send in forces into Poland to crush solidarity. Well, that's not what happens. Uh, the Soviets probably smartly decide that sending Soviet tanks into Poland that was pretty well organized at that time, solidarity was in the mines, in shipyards like Gdansk. Um, these were tough blue collar workers sending in Red Army forces um, that were either Soviet or or East German or, or from Czechoslovakia would almost certainly have been met with armed resistance. So instead, uh, in December of 1981, uh, the Polish leader declares martial law. And really one of my favorite photographs of the time, you can see Polish tanks in the, in the street, and in the, this is in Warsaw, and then in the back you see a, a, uh, um, a banner advertising, uh, they're showing the movie Apocalypse Now in theaters. So it was a really interesting, almost ironic um, example that, uh, of, of, of what was going on at the time. The right side of the screen, we see a lot of the detention centers that were established in Poland for member, members of Solidarity who were captured and then put in, in various detention centers. Lech Wałęsa himself was moved around at various sites probably uh, had the best treatment of anyone, really was more like at mansions than he was in prison. They kept him in pretty good shape. He was not tortured, probably drugged, uh, but was not tortured uh, like some other members of Solidarity were. But the organization in 1981 is in, and, and into 1982 is in serious shape. There are a number of projections at this time that uh, from, from the CIA, uh, that solidarity was on its last legs. So this then leads to a range of questions within the Reagan administration about what to do. Well, as Reagan officials recognize, even at the time, there is still a um, an, an underground that is weakened but active, and and it's not a violent one. It's not pursuing change through violent means, but through nonviolent means and primarily by publishing material. So the underground is, as you can see here, this is my photograph of the recreation of a solidarity shop. You see the printing presses, um, the reams of paper, you see typewriters, uh, all the elements you'd need to run an underground. Um, and then we see uh, one of Solidarity's newspapers. I've also highlighted uh, uh, Solidarity Radio, so there are multiple ways that Solidarity was communicating both to its population and its supporters in Poland, as well as getting information out to the rest of the world. And, and obviously at this time, um, Poland is, has state-run media, uh, Soviet Union state-run media as well. So there are obviously active attempts to uh, repress any information uh, that is not official state-sanctioned media. So all of these publications, the radio program from Radio Solidarity are all viewed as Ill illegitimate and dangerous and clearly illegal at this time. So from a, from a, a Reagan administ administration perspective, serious position of solidarity, a uh, little bit of activity, but things look pretty bleak. So this gets to uh, deliberations. Before I get to the actual program that Reagan authorizes, I think it is important to understand when the administration comes in um, through its National uh, Security Decision Directives, or NSDDs, the administration um, agrees to several of them, including 32 and NSDD 54. These are national security strategy, as well as US policy towards Eastern Europe. And what's important about these are at least two aspects. One is that they essentially authorize, support, 
U.S. offensive operations into Eastern Europe. And why is that important? It's important because in the aftermath of World War II, um, the uh, U.S. president at the time, um, uh, FDR, along with Winston Churchill, had largely agreed um, uh, with Stalin to allow the Soviets in Poland and in other areas of Eastern Europe uh, to be essentially theaters of Soviet influence. So most American presidents uh, since World War II essentially conceded Eastern Europe to the Soviet sphere of influence. It was very clear in Reagan administration documents that uh, they didn't care anymore, um, that uh, Eastern Europe was just as legitimate an area for the U.S. to conduct operations as anywhere else in the globe. After all, the Soviets had done the same in areas that at one point had been considered U.S. spheres of influence, including Latin America, in particular Cuba. So the first major change is the decision that the U.S. was going to go on the offensive in areas that the uh, Soviets had considered essentially their, their backyard, their sphere of influence um, in Eastern Europe. The second is, among other instruments of American power, um, President Reagan, who, as all of us know, was uh, at one point a Hollywood actor, he, as he called himself, a B, a B actor, uh, B, B movies, um, recognized the importance of information and influence. So we, we can see in these documents, particularly in the national security strategy, that he elevates information operations, essentially the same playing field as military, diplomatic, and other instruments of American power. So it, it raises the, the ability and the importance of covert action programs that aren't just lethal um, by providing military assistance, but also designed to influence local populations. And this becomes important as the administration looks at opportunities around the world. So what President Reagan does in the fall of 1982 is he authorizes a covert action program uh, to provide assistance to solidarity. And it goes by the cryptonym QR Helpful. There have been debates, some debates, about uh, whether the types of U.S. assistance should include weapons, for example. And one individual involved in the program that I spoke to uh, did look at how much weapons could be provided um, if they were to go down that road. But I think as most administration of officials that I spoke to who served at the time, uh, including individuals like Richard Pipes, who passed away recently, uh, said, you know, they, they argued strongly that solidarity was largely a peaceful movement that was focused on trade union activity and providing information through its publications. It made no sense to provide solidarity with weapons. In fact, it would have been deeply counterproductive because both the Polish state as well as the Soviet Union, would have severely cracked down on the um, uh, solidarity if, if it had had and used weapons. So instead, and, and, and obviously at this time, uh, the U.S. had its program started under the Carter administration and then ramped up under Reagan to provide lethal assistance, including Stinger missiles, to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. And that's what you see on the right side of the screen. The Solidarity was not a paramilitary program coming out of what's now special activities. It instead uh, was a political or psychological program uh, coming out of uh, covert action CIA. And, and that involved essentially providing money. Uh, the money was used to then buy non-lethal equipment to moderate Polish opposition groups, particularly Solidarity. The goals were very limited. They were not to overthrow the Polish regime. I think most U.S. government officials, including the CIA at the time, ones that I spoke to, uh, said that they recognized their ability to influence an outcome like the overthrow of Jaruzelski was way out of their control. It would have to be up to the Poles anyway. And, you know, they didn't want to do that, particularly through armed means. So it was to aid the organizational activities of, of solidarity to increase, augment their ability to communicate with the Polish people and also communicate with individuals outside of Poland, and then to exert more pressure 
on the Polish regime, regime to ease its repression and to start supporting at least limited democratic reforms in the country. So the objectives were pretty minimal, although obviously, as we'll see in a moment, uh, success was notable. Um, how do you get that kind of material into solidarity? It was a really interesting question. And when the Reagan administration agrees that it's going to provide covert assistance um, under what we call Title 50 authority, the, um, the, the, the real question is that how do you, what do the logistics look like? So uh, the way the, the CIA designs its program is it recruits assets, sur essentially surrogates, um, that, uh, that bring the material into Poland. Now, I think what, what you have to understand at this time was that, that you know, what, the program really starts up about 1983. And by that time, there's a huge black market of goods that came into Poland from Western Europe that many uh, Poles and others in Eastern Europe didn't have access to material, whether it was Western technology, in some cases, Western food products. Um, and there were a whole range of black market profiteers who were involved either through land routes like trucks or through through, um, uh, uh, through maritime uh, locations by boats that would get goods in. There was also plenty of legitimate trade that black marketeers would be willing to occasionally add banned items into what was uh, primarily legitimate trade. So what the CIA does is it recruits already um, uh, involved black market smugglers who are smuggling information and, and material into Poland. And so it gives them money, probably you know, 30 or so assets, uh, important assets um, that the CIA then recruits to, to provide, uh, to gives them money. And then they're the ones, so, so think for a moment how this works. CIA gives money to an individual, that individual then um, uses it to buy printer cartridges. Um, for solidarity. Uh, so he goes, he or she goes to buy the printer cartridges, puts them in the back of a truck. Truck is loaded up in Paris, uh, goes into Brussels. Uh, the, the, the goods on the truck are taken off. They're put on another truck. That truck then goes to Hamburg. The, uh, the uh, truck is, uh, the, the material is offloaded. Then it goes onto a boat and then it goes around to uh, Sweden and then eventually makes its way to Gdansk. By the time that, that um, the material gets to Poland, it may have changed hands multiple times. And then even when it gets to Poland, it has to go through multiple hands uh, to get into um, individuals in, in Poland. So you see, when you use surrogates or, or rat lines like this, it becomes impossible, really impossible, for, for, for the KGB or Polish intelligence uh, or law enforcement, when they seize individuals along these rat lines, they have no idea where this, the origins of this, of this material, where it's coming from. It's gone through so many different hands that um, it's the hand of the CIA is hidden. And it's really the, the lubricant money that's used to buy the equipment that Solidarity uses. So it's a really important um, aspect of surrogates that, that does this. Uh, there have been some initial reports and books that came out the uh, early post-Cold War years um, that said there was a covert CIA program uh, based out of the station at Warsaw um, that was providing assistance to Solidarity. Well, it turns out not to be true as I talked to in individuals involved in it, um, as I found. Some of the more important stations were in places like Paris, CIA station out of Paris. But there were also was assistance coming from Bonn and Brussels and Lisbon and Bern, West Berlin, Rome, even Mexico City. And, you know, there were other things that went on in addition to just material. It was also 
protests that the CIA at least helped provide some funding for. Um, uh, didn't necessarily organize them per se, but at least provided some support for these protest movements, including um, other areas like Mexico City, uh, in Paris suburbs, there were protests on key anniversaries, including Polish independence or the anniversary of martial law. There was a lot of activity that, that went to supporting solidarity more broadly. Um, and, and I think this is important to recognize that, that, that the assistance was you know, multi-purpose and, and multifaceted. One way to, to take a look at the type of activity uh, that the CIA provided, or at least the, the money was used for um, among members of Solidarity, were leaflets, posters. These are all seized by Polish and Soviet intelligence and law enforcement agencies. This, is, this comes from um, eventually declassified Polish documents. Uh, leaflets, posters, copies of journals and books, offset presses, Xerox machines, duplicators, silkscreen frames, typewriters, reams of paper, again, all things that one needs to operate in underground. So I think you, you can see where and what kind of material. Now, one thing that's really important to understand here is, at least to my knowledge, there was never an instance, at least not one that I'm aware of, in which a CIA case officer ever handed anything over to a member of Solidarity, let alone someone like Lech Wałęsa. It was always done through essentially black market smugglers who then provided it to um, Solidarity at the receiving end. And as I talked to many folks that are still alive today on the Solidarity side, you know, what they told me is, look, um, we recognized that we were getting assistance from someone or some entities. And in really, in a sense, it didn't matter. We needed the equipment. Whoever was providing it, we were grateful, but we had, we had no idea. We had suspicions that we didn't know. And certainly there were no meetings, especially in places like Poland. And, and as a few CIA case officers told me, um, even places like Solidarity's office in, in Brussels, there were a lot of concern about KGB penetration at that Solidarity office. So, you know, the, the, even Solidarity offices uh, in Western Europe were deemed way too concerning uh, to be uh, meeting with anybody there. So this is why they worked out of Paris and other locations. And again, they worked with black market smugglers. Another important aspect of this, um, though there's a myth about this, is the role of the Catholic Church. Uh, so the, the Pope at this time, uh, who is nearly assassinated about the same time as Ronald Reagan, which really brings them together, um, is Pope John Paul II. And there have been these, what I'll call myths, uh, that there was this uh, cabal involving senior Reagan administration officials and the Pope um, and other Catholic Church officials about this particular program, that they worked together to provide assistance, covert assistance, to Solidarity, particularly the Catholic Church and the CIA. Um, and, and here's what I would say after having looked uh, pretty in-depth at this, reviewed um, all of the available information in the Reagan Library and in the George H.W. Bush Library, uh, talked to uh, individuals involved in the CIA program is the following. One is that there certainly was a relationship between President Reagan and um, Pope John Paul II. I mean, they, they had a, a bond, they had a, a, a mutual affinity, and they both supported solidarity. So they were on the same team. Um, and they both had the same end goal, which was freedom in Poland and more broadly in Eastern Europe. In addition, a number of Catholic uh, church officials, priests, for example, including in churches like um, uh, St. Bridget's in Gdansk, supported solidarity. I mean, at St. Bridget's, uh, they allowed solidarity, member, so, uh, solidarity members to meet. And I've, I've, I've been to St. Bridget's, I've looked at some of these rooms. They allowed them to meet covertly, clandestinely, uh, to communicate, to have meetings, to pass messages, 
Um, and in some cases, material was smuggled through churches to get to the Solidarity members. So the, the, a number of officials within the Catholic Church certainly supported Solidarity and certainly supported providing assistance to Solidarity. But as, as I was told matter-of-factly by multiple people, um, the individual who was really in charge of this program, as well as every case officer that I interviewed, there was no, uh, with one modest exception that I'll highlight in a second, there was no uh, connection as part of this program, certainly the operational tactical levels between the CIA and the, and the Catholic Church, none. Uh, really, the only organization that was briefed pretty regularly and which was involved in a couple of other covert action programs was uh, British intelligence. The French were aware in part because the CIA was using its station in, in Paris to provide assistance. But in general, uh, this was done by the CIA as a CIA pro, uh, program. Now, I was told of a few instances where Catholic priests brought money into Poland. Um, they, they were generally not checked at bor borders when they came in. Uh, came into Poland, um, but it does not look to me like they were aware where the money was coming from. They just knew it was going to solidarity. And it was never given to them by a case officer. It was generally given multiple hands through to, to um, uh, from CIA and black market smugglers and eventually made its way to a priest who then gives it to solidarity in the end. So, and, and then and it, that was such a tiny percentage anyway. So the church is on the same side uh, but operates separately from, from QR Helpful, this particular program. You can see here, including in, in the Pope's visit to Gdansk, and this is, this is specifically the area that Lech, Lech Wałęsa is from, that he is an incredible inspiration to solidarity. And his visits, particularly by the late 1980s, are important in keeping solidarity alive and helping it grow. So what we see is that, uh, in particular, in the early stages of, uh, of the 1980s, after martial law, CIA assistance helps keep solidarity alive. And my assessment in looking at other sources of funding that solidarity was getting from various trade unions, including the AFL-CIO, trade unions coming from Europe, uh, like Italy, for example, um, that the uh, amount the CIA was giving was much greater, at least in the early years. By the end of the 1980s, the U.S. was actually giving a lot more through overt programs like the National Endowment for Democracy. So what this, to, to, to understand this more broadly, CIA provides assistance in the early 80s, by the mid to late 80s in particular, it's overtaken by much greater amounts of over assistance from the U.S. and, and other entities. Um, and so not only does solidarity survive, but it really starts to flourish as greater cracks occur in other areas of Eastern Europe. And then in 1989, Jaruzelski agrees to elections in Poland. And here, solidarity does extremely well. Um, on the right side of the screen, uh, we see a uh, poster here of High Noon. That's Gary Cooper. In the, uh, the actual poster, Gary Cooper is holding a six-shooter. Um, what CIA lawyers, I'm told, uh, felt very strongly about is they did not want to give a message of violence. So they, uh, there was some CIA assistance that went into some aspects of the elections. And the, um, uh, that six-shooter was changed to a ballot. So here we have Gary Cooper, high noon, uh, going to vote instead of uh, use his gun. So uh, Solidarity does extremely well in the 1989 uh, elections. And then in November of 1989, I won't show the video, but it's actually very dramatic. Lech Wałęsa visits the U.S. Congress. And he is met both among Democrats and Republicans as essentially a national hero, which, which he was. Uh, by, again, the fall of 1989, we see the collapse of the Berlin Wall 
the end of communism in Eastern Europe. And then by 1990, Lech Wałęsa is elected president of Poland. So we go from August of 1980, where he is the lead negotiator for the August Agreement. Ten years later, he's the president of the country. It's an incredible development. I'm actually going to hold off on current implications in part since I suspect uh, we may get to them. But let me just provide a, a short summary um, because many will ask, you know, what's, what kind of contribution did the CIA actually make? But here's my view. Um, is, that, uh, is that at the end of the day, the successes of solidarity in overthrowing the, uh, the uh, authoritarian communist regime uh, peace, through peaceful means, eventually at the uh, ballot box, the, the primary workers, the individuals that deserve the vast majority, really all of the credit are the members of Solidarity who risked their lives, some of whom were killed, some of whom were tortured. They're the ones who deserve the credit for what happened in Poland. There was also assistance that helped them survive in the darkest hours. And in the early stages after martial law, CIA did contribute to the survival of, of solidarity. It was, uh, according to my data, the largest contributor in the 83, 84, 85 period, the first few years after martial law, largest outside contributor to solidarity, which helped it uh, continue to operate, get its message out, uh, prevent collapse, and allowed it, survival allowed it then to get additional amounts of, of uh, overt funding from the National Endowment for Democracy and other entities. So in that sense, the CIA contribution was important, but it was not sufficient. It was the members of Solidarity who had to do the vast majority of their activity. So with that, I will turn this back to Hannah, and we will go to questions. Um, we do have a question um, from Facebook. What was the means by which the Soviets coordinated overt and covert efforts on slide five? Did they coordinate these efforts with the satellite countries? So slide, just, just so people uh, recognize, slide five, uh, slide five was the CIA overview of Soviet efforts, both covert and overt activities. Covert meaning forgeries placement of articles, use of front groups, uh, overt activities, propaganda from state-run media, and economic assistance and other things. So how did they coordinate? Um, they did it in several ways. One is the Service A of the KGB coordinated quite closely with uh, it, the, uh, its uh, sister agencies in East Germany, in Czechoslovakia, in Poland, and other locations. Um, and so we see that in the AIDS program. So KGB is the primary constructor of the AIDS disinformation campaign. Uh, so it, it, it thinks of the approach. It starts off with that letter that I mentioned earlier in, in an Indian newspaper. And then it works closely through its stations in, in Eastern European countries and countries overseas. It works through its KGB officers to help plant news stories in newspapers and on radio programs and eventually television uh, in, in local uh, locations. So um, it, it doesn't always coordinate. In some cases, KGB officers uh, through agents of influence, the, the uh, KGB might recruit a journalist in Japan, for example, who then puts information out. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there was coordination with an entity in Japan. So there's some combination of unilateral KGB activity, and in some cases, direct coordination with services in partner countries. We have another um, question here from Kurt Kloon, who is a doctoral student at the Institute. He asked, what was the coordination mechanism for the rat lines to ensure that the printer cartridges would get in the right hands? That is a very good question. So I have had this conversation with some of the case officers involved. 
And uh, this is essentially what they told me. Um, that in most cases, probably the most important component during the, this phase is who your key assets are, who you're going to recruit. And so you've got to be able to trust that individual. You know, you take a look at who that person is. QR Guide is one of the assets, for example, that I highlight in the book. Uh, and there's a lot of thought that went into which people to recruit. Um, how trustworthy they were, um, what was their ability to get material into the hands of solidarity. They basically checked a whole range of things before moving in to recruit. Some cases they were successful, some cases they weren't. So by the time you've reached an arrangement with someone, you've got a pretty good feeling for who they are, what they do, and how effective they are in getting Material again, they're already doing this as part of uh, regular work, even before participating in this program. So when money was handed over, let's say to someone like QR Guide, um, the CIA has very limited uh, understanding then of what is happening. Now, for legal reasons, in part as a covert action program, uh, the U.S. president has to sign this, and then it has to be. Uh, provided to uh, members of Congress, not all members, but members of the intelligence committees. So there's general uh, updating and briefing to members of Congress. So um, what the case officer said is they, you know, they had these assets. They provide, they did provide, um, they did provide uh, you know, what they used the money for, and then generally some sense of where it got to. But I will be up front in telling you it was probably virtually impossible for the CIA ever to be able to track every stage of where any of its material went and whether it got in the right hands. So, you know, they're much clearer at the beginning phases than at the end. So, you know, again, that's deliberate. So you essentially have to trust your sources and be very careful in picking and then at the end of the day, you know, hope that you've picked rightly. It's a good question. Another question here from Facebook. Um, I wonder if the current Russia is still practicing disinformation operation after the Cold War. And if so, what should the United States do to counter this? Yes, great question. Uh, I mean, the answer is absolutely. Uh, we see Russian disinformation in several forms. I mean, one of my favorite cases is the Malaysian Airlines Flight 17, which took off from the Netherlands. Um, it flew over Germany, Poland, and then was shot down in Ukraine by Russian-backed rebels with Russian uh, weapon systems, surface-to-air missiles. The uh, Russians ran a really interesting disinformation campaign after that, which basically raised all kinds of questions about who shot it down. Maybe it was... The Ukrainian government shot it down. Maybe it was the U.S. that shot it down. Maybe it was um, uh, Russian rebels that shot it down, but it had weapons on it. There are a whole range of possible explanations, and their hope was it would essentially cause confusion. So that anybody who was asked about the Malaysian Airlines flight would say, you know, I don't know who did it. I mean, there's all these explanations. I don't know which one is right. I don't know who to trust. Uh, so there are cases of disinformation meant specifically to sow confusion. Um, we see <coughs> other kinds of disinformation. One interesting aspect on disinformation today is that a lot of the, of the uh, uh, disinformation during the Cold War was done, as I noted earlier, by Service A of the KGB. Um, and today, actually, one of the most important organizations that has been involved in disinformation, including offensive cyber operations, the hack and leak components of cyber operations, is the main uh, uh, intelligence director or main director, the, the GRU or the GU, uh, which is essentially the equivalent of defense intelligence agencies. So they have different agencies that are, are doing this. And they've conducted disinformation on US platforms, and you know what I often try to tell people, much like various aspects of the Cold War when the Russians have been involved in disinformation, 
um, you know, it's, it's, it's not, you know, the, at the end of the day, uh, the Russians generally have never cared about supporting uh, Republicans or Democrats per se. Their goal is to weaken the United States, including weaken the U.S.'s relationship with some of its key partners, especially in Europe. So this is why we've seen GRU activity, for example, involved on both sides of multiple issues, from gun control to Black Lives Matter, including uh, some of the recent protests, both sides, uh, or all sides if there are multiple sides. Um, uh, so you know, their, their objective is to weaken US, the U.S. weak in U.S. institutions, so discord, polarization. Um, one last issue that I did want to highlight is, uh, is COVID-19. This is the, one of the more recent examples of Russian disinformation. And um, as, as folks probably remember, the Chinese first started talking about uh, the U.S. potentially uh, bringing COVID-19 in late 2019 into Wuhan with some sort of military gains. Uh, the Russians and the Iranians also went with this line. We also saw a Russian Ministry of Defense websites raising this question about whether COVID-19 was produced at uh, U.S. laboratories, including at Fort Detrick, Maryland. This is almost identical in sort of broad strokes to the Operation Denver campaign that I mentioned earlier in the 1980s, which tied AIDS, another pandemic, back to the um, uh, Fort Detrick, Maryland, and U.S. labs and raised questions about Department of Defense and CIA support. So, yes, uh, they've been even involved m most recently in disinformation about COVID. Another question here, um, would you be able to share the source citation for the use of CIA use of black market rat lines? Well, I would say this, uh, 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 two things. One is, um, you can read the book. Uh, the book has got hundreds and hundreds of footnotes. Um, the interviews with uh, the case officers, uh, did not, you know, they, most of them generally did not want their names to be associated with it. As you'll see at the end of the um, uh, book, uh, I did share a copy with the, with the CIA Office of Publications. Uh, so they did, did uh, review it, um, did share it with the CIA History Office. Uh, so they did review it. So uh, when I talked to individuals that were case officers involved, you know, they wanted to keep they are former spies. They did not want to be na uh, named, so um, I did not name them. So uh, you know, I'm, unfortunately, I can't provide any names. But I can say I interviewed a number of case officers. I interviewed the really the head of the CIA program who operated out of Langley uh, for this. Um, I talked to uh, Pipes uh, at the White House. Um, who was involved in all the initial discussions. Other, I talked to President George H.W. Bush, who was the vice president at the time, uh, who since passed away, about various aspects of this program as well. So I talked to people at multiple levels about elements of this, including about the, uh, the rat lines, but unfortunately can't share the uh, names of individuals. And the other aspect that, that was pretty sensitive as well is um, which assets were recruited. Now, I have the names of individuals that were recruited some of them are still alive, so we, cho we chose to use their cryptonyms. Uh, the names of CIA actually gave them like QR guides, so you're not gonna see QR guide's real name in the book. Um, he's still alive, so we've, I've decided to protect it, and uh, maybe at some, at some point we'll release it. I guess the answer to that question is to make sure you check out um, Dr. Jones's book. Um, but that's all the questions that we have today. I'd like to thank Dr. Jones for joining us today and all of you who tuned in here on Zoom and also Facebook. If you're interested in attending other upcoming webinar events, supporting IWP, or applying to one of our graduate programs, please go to iwp.edu. Again, that's iwp.edu. Thank you. Thank you.